Good evening. Now, I know that it is Thursday. I know that it's dinner time for some of you, but I'm also aware that there are a lot of incredible people in the room who are strong advocates, who are greatly concerned about the community. So we're gonna try that one more time and I wanna hear <laughs> that advocacy voice come out. Good evening. Good evening. That's the Arlington I know, there you go. My name is Carlos Velasquez and I am the chair of the Human Rights Commission and it's wonderful to see you all here. This is our second form for this year and we have made a commitment through the commission and in cooperation also with the EOC to have forums in the community as a way of not only talking about the work we do in the county, but also about the opportunities there are for people to understand their rights and what it means not to be discriminated. And it's interesting because I know that um, we live in a place, an environment where people feel included for the most part. But then we understand as we begin to dig a little deeper that there are biases. And some of these forms have really been a, an opportunity to unveil some of those biases that uh, do exist. And so I think this evening will be very insightful. As I just noticed, I'm the only male up here, so I feel very privileged to be allowed <laughs> to be amongst such an amazing brain power to my right and in front of me as well. I want to acknowledge the, the great work of the Human Rights Office and under the leadership of Raul, and thank you for all that you do for the county. And I know his team is all around us and some interns that we have for the summer, so thank you for your work in putting this forum together. And I've had the privilege of having coffee with Katie Crystal, our board liaison, and it's been wonderful. And the last time I think that we uh, engaged with one another, she realized that we have a lot of connections, including her doggy, that's named Bear, if I remember correctly. And that connection is that I'm a big fan, and not only of doggies, but especially bears. So Katie, thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> And I am going to ask that all our EEOC standing committee members and our fellow Human Rights Commission members go ahead and stand up and be acknowledged for being here and being present. Thank you. I know we are in good hands, so if anyone uh, has an accident or if some fire goes off, we know that we have the fire chief, uh, James Bonanzo here, as well as the deputy fire chief, uh, John Resterhan, who's also with us. Now, if there's a doctor in their house, we're really in good shape. As I mentioned earlier, in Arlington County, we often um, feel like we have a lot of opportunities and we feel like not too many biases may exist, but there are levels of discrimination that can happen and do take place. And the office is incredible in terms of being able to conduct the right kinds of investigations. But when we look at numbers at the national level, we know that globally, globally, 40% of the workforce is made up of women yet only 4.6% of all Fortune 500 companies have a CEO that's a female. So a huge gap there. And when we talk about the kind of biases that Latinos and African Americans face in the workplace, there are some. A recent Pew Research Center poll showed that about 42% of all Latinos face some kind of bias in the workplace, and about 71% of African Americans have felt some kind of unfair treatment. And then when we look at people with disabilities, the poverty rate is about 47%. And only about 35% of all people with disabilities who actually are of an age where they can work, they actually hold a job. So there are great gaps in terms of opportunities at the national level. 
and I don't know the numbers at the Arlington County level, but I think there's at least some room for thought. And someone who has as a primary responsibility uh, the job of enforcing EEOC regulations and policies is Mindy Weinstein, and she is the acting director of the Washington Field Office, and it's our pleasure for her to be here. And she's gonna share some insights in terms of her work and the office of EEOC. Mindy. Good evening, everybody. Um, I know this is gonna be a good night for me because last year I was at a presentation here and Ra as Raul remembered, um, my 16-year-old teenage son was in the audience and everybody asked really nice questions except he asked a really hard question. So you'll note I have no children with me here tonight. <laughs> it's gonna be good. <laughs> um, thank you for including me in this. Um, session that you are having today. I think it's a really important topic and I thought I would just share um, an overview of what the EEOC does um, in enforcing the laws that prohibit discrimination in employment. So I'll, I'll move kind of quest, fast and I know there's gonna be time for questions. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at that point. So basically these are the laws that the EEOC enforces. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Age Discrimination Act, Equal Pay Act, a portion of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the most recent law we are enforcing, the Gen Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And these are the types of discrimination that we cover. This is what is covered under federal law um, in terms of prohibiting discrimination in employment. So race, color, sex, national origin, religion, age if you're 40 or older, um, our laws prohibit discrimination also against people with disabilities. Um, it, they prohibit discrimination based on genetic information and all the laws we enforce say you can't retaliate against somebody who opposed discrimination at work or filed a charge with us or with our state or local partners such as the Arlington Agency. Um, in terms of who, which employers are covered under federal law, um, under most of the laws we enforce, if an employer has at least 15 people who work there, they're covered by federal law. For the Age Discrimination Act, it's a little bit higher, it's 20. But um, in, in the EEO laws under uh, the federal framework cover employers, employment agencies, temp agencies, labor unions, universities, state and local governments, federal governments, um, all sorts of different entities. So I thought I'd focus a little bit about uh, on the topic today in terms of what are the barriers and talk about the kinds of cases we see and um, how that fits into the topic that we're focused on tonight. So one of the primary barriers is people who are just um, intending to discriminate against somebody because of their race or sex or disability or national origin and age. We see this in a wide range of different types of cases. And a few of them are listed here on this slide. But for example, if you're recruiting only at certain places where you know everybody there is gonna be white or gonna be 18 years old or going to be of a particular um, sex, then you could be engaging in discrimination intentionally based on bias in recruitment. And the same kind of thing, of course, could happen at the hiring stage if you're only hiring p people in um, particular groups for particular jobs or just generally at your company. So if a company is just hiring um, women or just hiring men or at a restaurant, say, and it's only hiring people of a particular race for the back of the house positions versus the front of the house positions and all the bartenders are men and the you know, servers are um, female, whatever, then this is an example of this kind of intentional discrimination that we would be focused on. Another area that this could involve is pay discrimination, where you're obviously paying people of a different um, sex or race, et cetera, um, different wages. Um, it comes up in discipline cases, suspension cases, all sorts of different cases where people are alleging that they were treated differently intentionally based on the color of their skin or um, because of any of the types of factors that I mentioned before. And of course, we also um, cover cases of alleged discrimination and discharge, 
which is a you know a frequently alleged type of discrimination that we receive. So sometimes a, a, one person hires someone who's Muslim or who's a particular um, national origin or race, and maybe a new boss comes in, and then that person is fired, and now they're alleging they were discriminated against because of their race or uh, religion or national origin. So there's a wide variety of types of discrimination that intentional discrimination um, covers. It also involves harassment. Um, we hear a lot about sexual harassment cases, and um, there are, we, we receive a lot of them. There's other types of cases too, racial harassment, disability harassment, national origin harassment, where someone, again, is intentionally targeting someone for a particular treatment because of who they are, the color of their skin, their gender, et cetera. Um, the, another type of case that we have is where the barrier is not so much intentional discrimination, but some sort of neutral policy or practice that disparately impacts a particular group. So if an employer has a, um, a policy that, well, some employers used to have more so in the past, like that they wouldn't hire anybody who's ever been arrested. Okay, well in certain communities that has a huge impact on the ability of people in a particular racial group or national origin group to get hired. Or maybe a gender group too, maybe it's a combination of, of those. So the, the policy itself, we won't hire people who have been arrested, that doesn't sound biased, right? It's not like we won't hire people in a particular racial group or gender group, but it has the impact of excluding a bunch of people from a particular job. There are other examples too, like if um, an employer only hires people of a certain height, and maybe that has a disparate impact on women or on certain national origin groups, or only hires people with certain, um, with a high school diploma. Um, only hires people with certain credit rating is an issue that's um, in the news right now. Um, only hires people with certain kinds of um, accomplishments, went to certain schools. All of these could potentially have a disparate impact on a particular group, and may be illegal under the laws that EEOC enforces unless um, it turns out that the employer can show that this is job related. We needed people to be able to lift that many pounds or have that level of education in order to do this particular job and why it's necessary for the operation of the business. And um, another way we look at the issue of barriers is not just intentional discrimination where you're treating people purposefully different or these kinds of neutral policies that have a disparate impact, but also in some cases, people need an accommodation in order to do their job. So um, the law in two different areas, disability um, cases and also religion cases, says an employer has to not only treat people the same and not be intentionally discriminating, and um, but you also might have to make a special accommodation for a person based on their disability or religion. So disability is the most commonly thought of one where you might have to provide special equipment or you might have to slightly adjust the non-essential functions of someone's job or, or um, provide some sort of physical accommodation in the workplace. Or, and, and the failure to do these things, of course, could be a huge barrier to somebody who has a disability, lots of different types of disabilities. Um, and I thought I would just mention, there's also an obligation for employers to provide some kind of accommodation for religion. So a person who needs to have um, breaks for prayer or um, time off for religious observance or there's a wide range of different kinds of religious accommodations. And in both cases, whether it's a person with a disability or a person for, based on a religious need, can request an accommodation. And they aren't automatically entitled to it. It has to be something that would be effective and for a disability allow them to be able to do the job. And the employer doesn't have to do anything. You can't come in and say, you know, I would really like this you know, humongous screen on my wall mounted, and I'd also like it in the conference room because sometimes I work there. And, you know, you can't have anything, but you, you're entitled to what you need to be able to do the job that you were hired to do, unless it would cause the employer an undue hardship. So um, that the failure to accommodate is another barrier. 
Um, these are, this is a list, which I'm happy to talk about later, of just the different kinds of priorities that the EOC has right now. And I, I would just mention one in particular in light of the topic we're covering tonight. Eliminating barriers in recruitment and hiring is a large, you know, important priority at the EOC. So where an employer has um, and discriminate against a large group of people, especially, so if you have a situation where there are no women being hired for these jobs, or very, very few, or people of color, or um, whatever group it might be, if we see barriers to hiring a, in a wider context, or um, neutral pol policies that are having a disparate impact on a large group of people, that is one of the top priorities at the commission right now. I just thought I'd mention um, briefly, an individual can file a charge with EEOC. In most instances, you have 300 days to do that. There are a few exceptions to that, but um, in our area where, there's a, where the type of discrimination is covered by a state or local law, the, um, you have 300 days. Otherwise, the deadline is 180. Once a charge is served, we send it to the employer within 10 days. We're now in a um, new scheme where we're serving these almost always electronically. We s get an email address of the employer. So if you're an employer and you're here and you're like, what? Come and give me your email address and I'll make sure you're in our system. Um, we would typically request a response to the charge or maybe invite the employer to participate in our mediation program. Um, here's some highlights of our program. It's free, it's confidential, it's voluntary, it's fast, it moves things along. You don't necessarily have to hire a lawyer and write a whole big position statement and explain, you can just come in, work together, resolve it. About 75% of the charges that go into our mediation program resolve successfully. Um, these are the kinds of things we might be doing during an investigation, sending a request to the employer for information, getting data, talking to people, visiting the employer's um, location in some cases, sometimes bringing the parties into our office and holding a conference where we try to talk to everyone and figure out what the facts are. Um, different ways we may resolve a case, many of our cases settle, some in our mediation program that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, in some cases, we don't think there's sufficient evidence of discrimination, we issue a right to sue, and the person can go to court on their own. And in some cases, we think it is uh, more likely than not that there was discrimination. We issue what's called a reasonable cause finding. And then we begin conciliation, where we make an effort to work with the parties and settle the case for something which we think is appropriate relief. And if we can't achieve that, we may litigate the case ourselves in federal court. Um, and finally, these are the remedies that are available. Um, people are entitled to essentially what they would have had if they hadn't been discriminated against, such as the pay that they lost when they were fired or the pay that they were denied when they were um, paid lower wages based on sex or race or whatever it may be. Um, under several of the statutes we enforce, there may also be compensatory and punitive damages, which are determined by how big the company is. The bigger the company, the, the more likely that the cap of $300,000 could be obtained. And then also non-monetary relief, changes in policies. It's an accommodation case under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We might want a new ADA policy, a new procedure, a new person designated as the person you, you request an accommodation from. We try to be clever, maybe is too strong, but smart <laughs> about um, what, what would fix the problem, not only for this person, but for the next person who may be in that situation. So it could be policy changes, it could be um, procedure changes, new, new policies, um, and training for folks so that they know what the law is and how to comply with it in the future. So that's a brief, quick overview of everything we do. And as long as we don't, you don't ask any hard questions, we're going to have a really good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing to me that you made probably the best decision, and that is not to bring your son. Yeah. <laughs> See, everything is fair, except when it comes to family. Right? Sometimes. They can be your best friends or your most honest enemies. <laughs> so now we have the pleasure of having Marie Price address us as a professor of geography and international affairs at George Washington University and a board member of the Dream Project. And she will talk about employment barriers facing immigrants in the DC metropolitan area. Dr. Price.
Welcome and thank you for coming on a hot and sticky July night, although it feels kind of cool up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have, I'm a geographer by training. I've done a lot of work on, on migration and mapping immigrants. And the last few years, I've done a lot of work looking at questions of immigrant inclusion and exclusion. Um, not just in the Washington metropolitan area, but other parts of the world. So I'm going to give you a quick visual tour of some of the patterns that have I observed, some quick observations about barriers immigrants face, and then move on and let the rest of this panel speak. Um, can you see that all right? Um, I, uh, let us be clear, metropolitan Washington is a major immigrant gateway. One in five people were born in a foreign country. One in five. And if you look at this pinwheel here, the largest group is Salvadoran, followed by India, Korea, China, Mexico, Vietnam, Philippines, Guatemala, Ethiopia, Peru, Bolivia, Honduras, Pakistan, Iran, Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica, United Kingdom, and then everybody else in the pinwheel. Um, the world is here. And um, why this relates to our topic is that the vast majority of that group, if you think about those countries of origin, are, would be classified as minority in this society, and half of those people are women. So if you want to address discrimination uh, that women and minorities face, you, you better look at the immigrant community. Um, and this is a tape uh, chart, which I guess you, can you see the bottom? Probably can't. The basic idea is that uh, 1970, 1980, very small immigrant population, and it really began to surge in, from 90 to 2010. Um, and so the, the Washington area that people knew, say, 40 years ago, has completely changed. And I'm sure all of you have had that experience in your life in terms of the diversity of, of people here. Um, in this graph, we were, I was just trying to designate, again, the metro area, DC, the inner core, um, inner suburbs and outer suburbs and far suburbs. And then in this table to point out that uh, comparing the growth between 2000 and uh, 2013, the foreign born population increased by about 50% in the metro region, but actually Arlington in that time lost population in terms of foreign born. And I don't think that's for any discriminatory practices. I think it's about the gentrification of Arlington. It's become, this used to be a first place that immigrants came to. Think of, say, the arrival of Vietnamese in the 70s or, or other groups. And now, because of the price, um, uh, at one point, I think Arlington County got to about 22% foreign born, and we're probably more like at 16% foreign born. So we're now slightly below the regional average. But the other important thing is some of the outer suburbs, like Loudoun County, who's been in the news, or Prince William County, they experienced a growth in foreign born two and three times. And so uh, there seems to be a pattern of when you have an area that experiences dramatic demographic change, you get uh, a backlash. And, uh, and we've certainly seen that in this area, even though overall we haven't had some of the more extreme backlashes that other areas have experienced. There's a political scientist, Robert Putnam, who works at Harvard, and one of his longitudinal studies came up with the conclusion that in modern multicultural diverse societies that we live in, the biggest challenge we face is building a broader sense of we. And we know, have a lot of we right now going on in this country. Um, and I, I, I do think it's not just a US problem, it's in a lot of places. Um, so, um, and to counter that, there's some really interesting demographic trends. Uh, so this is just comparing native born, foreign born. And the data is a couple years ago from the American Community Survey. And this map just basically shows the concentrations of foreign born. But on average, the foreign-born are, um, foreign are a little older than the native-born, uh, a little higher married couples with family, average family size a little larger, a little less with having bachelor's degrees, but, uh, and a little less with master's degree, but again, very high levels of education, um, pretty high income levels. 
Um, owner occupancy houses, again, a little less, but not that much less. Uh, and um, speak language other than English. Of course, the foreign born have a very high level of that, 82% versus 10% for the native born. The one socioeconomic variable that really stands out is there's 38% that say they don't speak English very well at all. So one of the advantages what metropolitan Washington has, and so does Arlington, um, is that we have, in general, not all immigrants, have attracted fairly high-skilled, uh, fairly well-educated, and, uh, and overall, in terms of income earnings, they've done all right. Now, this isn't everybody, but an aggregate. And that's not the message that's out there in the media. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so what are the challenges that immigrants face? And, and this panel knows more, but uh, certainly language is a huge challenge. And there's never enough uh, programs, especially for adult English learners, to, to improve those skills. Secondly, um, there's a huge challenge for people coming f to this country with foreign degrees that don't have their skills or are training recognized. And so there's a lot of issues with highly skilled people doing jobs at a, uh, a much lower skill level than they're actually qualified for, and any policies that could try to improve that. Um, I've done some work on entrepreneurship amongst immigrants, and um, interestingly, almost all foreign-born have much higher rates of self-employment, um, and, and I think that's a, a driving spirit, but there's also the experience of blocked mobility, and that is if you can't get that job, then you make your own. Um, and so this is a, a strategy, it sometimes works, and, uh, but, and it leads to many immigrant communities actually creating businesses and, and uh, building, um, uh, being important economic contributors, but it isn't maybe always their, their first choice. The, the points that um, Mindy made, biases about religion, language, ethnicity, race, all, all potentially there. The other very different one is legal status that the foreign born face. So um, it, it isn't the obvious one that people think about, maybe you're undocumented, but there's visas you can come in uh, that, um, say an H-1B visa where uh, the person who receives the visa can work but the spouse cannot. Um, there um, is DACA, which is deferred action, which actually gives you legal rights to work, although, knock on wood, DACA stays with us. Um, uh, into the later into the year, um, then and various visa types that complicate the labor relationship, and then finally, what's so important is that even though we have a federal laws, um, it's local policies, attitudes, and approaches that make all the difference. And we know there's huge variance throughout the country of how immigrants are addressed and incorporated. And um, some of the, the work that I've done in, in sort of mapping these differences and looking at differences in, in uh, uh, say, stays of deportation by jurisdiction, it's pretty stunning. Arlington does quite well in that regard, and, and so does Northern Virginia, but uh, there, are, there are issues and challenges. I was reading this, uh, The Economist, a couple nights ago, and I came across this graphic, and it stopped me in my tracks. Um, this was, I think, uh, 10 days ago this came out. So the question is asked, and this is a national survey between October of this year and March, uh, thousands of people, how important is it that whites work together to change laws unfair to whites? And, uh, a, and it's divided between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and Republicans, about 45% uh, said it's extremely important and very important, but then so did almost 28% of Democrats. Um, if you show, I think you show a graph in this room and people just roll their eyes, like what laws are we talking about? Um, and yet this um, political moment we're in, there is a, a, a significant population, mostly white, that feels somehow their status, their place has been challenged. And that explains some of this reactive politics. But at the same time, it makes it very hard to have these conversations about 
being more inclusive of, of difference, of minorities, of, of women. Um, fortunately, there's a big blue line at the bottom of the graph, you can't say it, where people think this is not important at all, uh, and they're Democrat. Uh, but uh, you, when you look at this, you realize this is the challenge that we're facing right now. Um, and then briefly, the kind of work I've been doing in, in, in uh, mapping, this is a map showing the distribution of Asian foreign born in the metro area, is looking at um, spatial inclusion. Where do people live? Where do they invest? Where do they recreate? That tells you a lot about what places are more inclusive or not. Um, there's all sorts of strategies of political inclusion. Arlington County has made the has this aspirational vision to be a diverse and inclusive world-class urban community, and uh, I applaud that agenda. Um, there are many ways to do this. Not a city can't give a path to citizenship, but a county can allow voting in local elections, for example. It is done. Um, how do you create um, opportunities for, for local, um, uh, so that the foreign born who become uh, citizens could feel uh, invested enough to be leaders. Um, economic inclusion for a lot of foreign born, particularly if they come from very uh, uh, poor developing countries, just understanding financial literacy, banking, this is I know work that Arlington does in other jurisdictions, entrepreneurship and training, explaining you know, loan systems and minority opportunities. These are all some of the, the ways that uh, both lending facilities and, and uh, businesses can uh, foster greater economic conclusion. And one of the things that I've found in my research is that places like this, public libraries, are vital to cultural and, and social inclusion, the resources they provide, the facilities. Um, but there are other ways, outreach in multiple languages, um, making uh, recreational sites, sports leagues, those sorts of things all become really important in building a sense of we. And then in terms of institutional uh, inclusion, immigrant groups often have very strong institutions. They might be tied to churches, they might be um, um, ethnically based uh, as business associations, but any way that Chamber of Commerce, minority business organizations uh, reach out and, and foster entrepreneurship and business uh, makes for stronger opportunities for newcomers. And then lastly, I couldn't help but put in a plug for um, the Dream Project. Do any of you know about that organization? Uh, Emma Villaled Sanchez, a former school board uh, member and chair, uh, is the founder. And we uh, work ex um, with immigrant youth, particularly those whose legal status creates barriers to higher education. Um, uh, on June 16th at Wakefield High School, we gave out 77 scholarships to uh, immigrant youth uh, going to universities in Virginia, mostly. And um, it's an ongoing effort uh, and a very um, direct effort to be inclusive, particularly to youth that are really in need of support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Price. Now we're going to follow the program as the speakers are listed. And Andrea Johnson is with the Equal Justice Works Fellow and a National Women's Law Center. And I was reading her bio and she has incredible and very impressive credentials. But two things stuck out for me. One, that she went to Columbia Law School. And the other part is that she's a proud Midwesterner from Minnesota specifically. And I actually spent some time in Minnesota. And I knew I was at a place that was very different. The very first time I landed in Minnesota, and for those of you who fly off and you understand this phenomenon, that the moment the little beep bell goes off on a plane, people just stand up really fast to get out of the plane as quickly as possible, right? But not in Minnesota. <laughs> people just took their time, and I stood up really fast and I thought, why isn't anyone moving? Because people in Minnesota are very nice. And Andrea, tell us about the work you do and your commitment to creating inclusive environments. Andrea. Should be on. Hello. Are we on? Okay. 
thank you for that. I'm, I'm from Minnesota, which I'm very proud of, and it's always exciting to hear other people be excited about that, because sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. But <laughs> I'm actually about to move to Virginia in a few weeks, to Alexandria, not Ar Arlington. Sorry about that. But I'm excited to see that I'm in the inner core. I keep telling my partner, you're taking me out to the suburbs. How could you? Uh, but this is the inner core, so um, and it's, it's beautiful here. Um, but yes, as you said, I'm at the National Women's Law Center. I am on our workplace justice team. Uh, if you're not familiar with the National Women's Law Center, it's a nonprofit up in D.C. that's been around since 1972. And we work to uh, defend the legal rights and opportunities of women and girls and to help women and families achieve economic security. We do that through working on a variety of issues um, because women have live holistic lives. We are not all just focused on economic security, so we're focused also on education, sexual assault on campus, re reproductive rights and health, childcare, issues like equal pay, and the changing face of the workplace. Um, all of those things are tied together because they play a large role in women's economic security. Um, and as I said, I'm in the workplace justice team, so I work a lot on policies on also litigation related to equal pay, which we've discussed as being a priority for the EEOC, and also pregnancy accommodations, which is another priority uh, for the EEOC. And we also work on other issues like sexual harassment um, and occupational segregation, uh, things to that effect. And so I thought I'd touch briefly a little bit on the work we do in regards to equal pay and pregnancy accommodations, um, and start by just mentioning what the wage gap is in Virginia. Um, since this is a, a number that really represents a lot of things, and so I'd like to unpack that. Um, in Virginia today, uh, if we look, look at women of all races, so women overall, uh, women in Virginia make 78 cents for every dollar paid to men. So that's two cents lower than the national average. Um, but it's a very different story if we look at women of color who experience intersectional discrimination. So their race and gender are playing, uh, interacting in a way that means that they uh, confront a lot more discrimination. For black women in Virginia, they're making 60 cents, six zero, 60 cents for every dollar paid to white non-Hispanic men. And Latinas, it's 53 cents. So those are very low numbers, and I don't have the numbers here in front of me, but we have some great fact sheets on the National Women's Law, Law Center website that talks about what that means of our lifetime. And those numbers for Latinas, for example, that means one, uh, upwards of $1 million are lost to the wage gap over a lifetime. So this is a significant uh, financial impact. Um, as I said, I wanted to unpack what goes into the wage gap. I know there's a lot of naysayers about the wage gap uh, sometimes. But it's a good number to kind of discuss all the different discrimination that women face um, in the workplace and, and in life. Um, as Mindy discussed, you know, there's a lot of intentional discrimination that still takes place. Uh, employers that say, I'm going to pay you less because you're a woman. You probably have a husband at home who's taking care of, of, the, pay, of the bills mostly, and so I don't need to pay you as much. That still exists. Um, increasingly, we see a lot of implicit biases, and these are really hard to get at with the law and with investigations. It's, it's hard to root out, and you know, we all kind of hold implicit biases, and there's lots of gender biases um, against women, just, and caregivers in particular, seeing them as less competent, less committed to their work, um, and, and this really has an impact that women are perceived negatively in negotiations. You know, you're, we're told to lean in and negotiate, but oftentimes, we're perceived negatively for doing so. We're seen as greedy and not a team player and a less favorable candidate because we've negotiated. Um, and it also has an impact, these implicit biases, on how women are perceived in performance evaluations or how they, their experiences are, are perceived when, you know, on their resume compared to men. And so there's a great piece of research out there showing a number of scientists who were given resumes that were the exact same resumes, and one said, um, what were the names? Something to the fact of Jane and Joe. Uh, I think it was Jennifer or some other names that were more normal. Um, and exact identical resumes. And Joe uh, was given a starting salary that was $4,000 more than Jane was given by this group of scientists. So those biases still very much exist. And as I mentioned, they very much exist for um, mothers. And there's a wage gap for mothers, um, which let's see if I have it here for Virginia. Um, 
Yeah, there's studies showing that mothers are recommended for lower starting salaries because they're, as I said before, they're perceived as less competent, less um, likely to, and they're less likely to be recommended for higher than non-mothers. And the effects for fathers are actually the opposite. Uh, fathers are recommended for significantly higher pay and perceived as more committed to their jobs than non-fathers. So um, in Virginia in 2015, mothers only made 67 cents for every dollar paid to fathers. So there's a lot of these biases that we're working uh, against and the equal pay laws out there, um, the Equal Pay Act and Title VII help to fight against that, but there are a lot of practices that employers use that, uh, as Mindy was saying, appear neutral but actually have a, a discriminatory impact. And one of them that we're focusing on a lot recently that's a sort of exciting new area of law is the question about salary history. I don't know if anybody's been following this. I assume you don't all have Twitter feeds that are all equal pay all the time, like mine is, but um, Massachusetts passed a law last year uh, saying that employers cannot ask the salary history question in an interview. And that's because when that question's asked, that perpetuates gender pay disparities that women and men have experienced throughout their lives. And it forces a woman who's experienced pay discrimination in a prior job to carry that discrimination with her throughout her career. And that's just not fair. And it's really not a question that most employers need. Uh, I think employers like to have as much information as they, they can get. Um, and, and they'll point to, you know, this is a good way to weed out applicants that might not be interested in a job because we're going to offer a lower salary than, they're, than they really want. But you can ask a candidate, candidate what their desired salary is or their, the pay that they need is. But asking that prior salary question is going to potentially um, uh, result in them being screened out because their prior pay uh, was too low and thus they're seen as not qualified enough for the job or because their prior pay was too high um, and, and thus they're assumed to not be interested in the job. So um, the impact we're really concerned about is that women on average come in with lower wages than men that they're being compared against uh, in interviews and, and when you're asking that question it's going to result and, and you're setting pay based on that, um, it's going to result in women having lower lower pay. Um, and I don't know how much time you want me to talk here. I, I'll just kind of sum up a little bit some of the other dynamics that, so there's those neutral practices like that in regards to pay. Um, there's also the fact that um, women are, there's a lot of barriers such as sexual harassment that prevent women from getting into higher paying non-traditional jobs like construction um, or some of the STEM professions. There's a lot of hazing and harassment that happens and that's a whole thing that I could speak at length about um, as well. Um, and those, those barriers are very real. I mean, if we work a lot with women in trade, so construction, um, plumbers, uh, steel workers, things like that, and it's like going back to the 1950s sometimes. It's, it's the, the amount of harassment that they, and outright discrimination that they encounter is, is intense, and it makes it very hard to get into those professions. It makes it very hard to stay in. Um, as a result, we see that a lot of women are clustered into lower paying jobs, and women actually make up two thirds of, um, of the low wage workforce. So those, I think we're defining it now as women who make, or folks who make less than $15. Um, and those jobs, you know, retail restaurant jobs, are jobs that have really unpredictable work schedules. And when you don't know your schedule, you know, more than a few days in advance, or it's changing at the last minute, it's really hard to schedule childcare. It's hard to take a class. It's hard to have a second job. And women still shoulder the majority of caregiving responsibilities, so that makes it really difficult for women to make the money that they need to make to support their families and to care for their families still. Um, so it puts them into these impossible um, positions. And then things like pregnancy accommodations, um, especially in those low-wage jobs, are really hard to come by. So you might have a worker working at a big retail store who is pregnant and needs a bottle of water because it's super important to stay hydrated while you're pregnant so you don't get a UTI. Um, or while you're, if you're breastfeeding while you're um, <clears throat> lactating, it's also very important to stay hydrated uh, for that whole process. And employers will say, you know, it's our policy that you can't have a bottle of water at your workstation and so that, thus you don't get one. And because you've made the request, we're just going to put you on an unpaid leave or we're going to fire you. Um, and so that's, we get a lot of calls to, to that effect. You know, it's not always a water bottle. Sometimes it's asking for light duty because you have a lifting restriction, things like that, where there's no effort made to ac accommodate that person. Um, you know, despite the fact that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act says you can't discriminate based on pregnancy or um, related medical conditions like lactation, um, uh, and you need to treat pregnant workers um, 
the same as those who, who might need accommodations uh, because of another inability to work. Uh, a lot of these workers are not getting the accommodations they need, and that leads to them being kicked out of work um, and at a time when their financial needs are growing. So I could go on and on. There's lots of different dynamics that play into women being placed in this position of less economic security despite all of their best efforts to get ahead, to have a job. Um, and so I'm happy to answer questions about the work we do. But Thank you, Andrea. Latoya Bell is a senior staff attorney at the Washington Lawyers Committee, and it's great to see you here. I know that you also host the Knowing Your Rights presentations with the ACLU of Maryland. And Latoya, if you can tell us a little bit um, about, give us some take home messages about what employers can do in relation to fighting discrimination and ending bias. Um. So I'm a senior staff attorney with the Washington Lawyers Committee, and prior to that position, we were the Employment Justice Center, DC Employment Justice Center, and we run our workers' rights clinics. And when they asked me what would I present on, I said, hmm, criminal convictions, the impact of a mm -hmm. criminal conviction on employment as a barrier. And given my background, that makes sense. I served as a public defender on the Eastern Shore of Maryland for four years. Um, and people would ask, how can you represent those people? Mm. So I represented those people because I knew the collateral consequences of that conviction. And the impact of a conviction has different effects in different jurisdictions, different states. But a place like the Eastern Shore where there's no industry, the impact is devastating. The only employers there are chicken plants, primarily. Tyson's, Purdue, Emick Farms, and things of that sort. And so the impact of the conviction becomes cyclical because once you're convicted, even after you serve your time, there's probably a fine assessed. And then there's probation. If you're supervised, it's a fee that you pay monthly. And so if you don't pay your fees, you fall behind, what happens? Brought in for a violation of probation and you're incarcerated and it starts all over again. <clears throat> now, there are 28 states that have passed ban the box initiatives, which doesn't prohibit the employer from asking about it, but it changes the process. So it removes the question or is required to be removed from applications. And once a conditional offer of employment is made available or made to the worker, then the employer can discuss or dig into the facts behind the criminal conviction. However, in DC, and that's primarily where our focus has been as the Employment Justice Center, there's a balancing test. And so there are factors that the employer needs to consider when discussing the conviction. The duties and tasks of the specific job assignment as it relates to the conviction. Um, the function, uh, the, excuse me, the age, how much time has lapsed, things like that. And in DC, the only relief for individuals where there's violations is the sanction. And a portion of that sanction can be awarded to the worker. What we're pushing for and encouraging more states and jurisdictions to do is allow a private right of action and allow individuals to sue for damages. Um, in DC, there's a little bit added protection because returning citizens, as they're called, are a protected class under the DC Human Rights Act. And when you leave a place like DC and you go to a place like the Eastern Shore, you appreciate that protection all much more. Um, how many people know who Sean Hopwood is? You probably heard the story on social media. He's a young man who was convicted of robbery. He is now a professor at Georgetown Law School, but he's a white male. So we're talking about le leveling the playing field. Think about that circumstance, that situation, if that was a woman or a person of color or a Latino. So that's what I'm encouraging employers to do. Thank you so much. Wanda Cumberlander is, as listed in the program, a consultant, but she is all, was assistant dean and faculty member at Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies in Human Resources Management. And Ms. Cumberlander, how do we create a culture in an organization that celebrates diversity, is inclusive, and 
as can be done consistently and not just for observances of the holiday? Good question. Um, I, I think I can do it without this. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I don't think I need this. Uh, the recording. Oh, okay. All righty. If you say so. <laughs> so um, I started out my career in um, EEO and affirmative action a long time ago, working in the private sector and um, got a lot of solid experience doing um, EEO kinds of things, doing affirmative action plans, which I'm sure you know something about, Mindy, and uh, working with um, the Office of Federal Com Compliance Programs. Um, and so um, the reason I, I think I, I went in that direction was because I've always felt like an advocate and wanted to be an advocate for people who um, seem to, to need help or could use help. So an advocate working in social ju justice issues and issues of equality. So it's always been in the background of what I've done. So I've done lots of things that you probably don't have time to, to hear about. But um, a, a frame would be uh, started out in corporate America, EEO affirmative action. I was a human resources um, director uh, in the private sector. Then I went on to, uh, I moved to DC from, from the New York area. And I, um, <clears throat> before that, actually, um, diver diversity sort of evolved. So I started working in diversity. So I was head of diversity uh, at a couple companies. And, um, and so I've been back and forth in internal, external, in terms of working with uh, employees and working with clients. And um, so now I do a lot of consulting. So I do training and advocacy work, social justice, and so forth. So getting to the question that I was asked about the kinds of things that can be done in organizations to um, remove some of, of, of those barriers for women and minorities, and other than just uh, having a, an ethnic day, cooking different foods, right? <laughs> different dishes from different areas of the country, the world, or whatever. Um, so, so actually, I, I've thought a lot about this because in addition to, again, doing a number of the things that I've mentioned to you, I'm also an academic. I like doing a lot of research. I, I'm always researching something, and many times it has to do with issues of social justice. So, so I, I think there's, there are different levels of um, <clears throat> issues as it relates to minorities in particular, because I think it's different for women. Not that it isn't that, that women don't have those, um, have, have issues as well, but I think the issues are different for women, uh, especially if the woman is not an ethnic minority. So um, I think access is important, <clears throat> and, and that's, that would be level one. And, and usually, those are individuals who don't have experience, may ha not have graduated from college, in some cases may not even graduated from high school, and so just getting access into the workplace, into the workforce, is difficult for them. So some of their barriers are going to be different than barriers for someone who has got a college degree. They may have issues of just skills issues, childcare issues, training issues, because they just haven't had much training and access. They may have transportation issues. Um, so it's going to be difficult uh, for them because they may not be able to get to work. They may not have anyone to watch their children. So I think that's one level. Um, the second level would be talent and, and talent factors. And that would be an individual who graduated from college, let's just say, may be um, a, a, a recent graduate or they graduated three years ago. And so they're really fighting the competition to get that job. So it's competition uh, is a barrier for them. Recruitability, employability, because they're looking now, they're fighting with a whole bunch of other folks in the workplace, in the, work, in the workforce, um, that have similar kinds of backgrounds. So I think that that's probably a really crucial point also for many individuals as well. And um, when you're at that point, I think that's a major turning point for you because you could go either way. You could excel or you could kind of get stuck at that level. So that's level two. So level three would be um, factors around uh, development upward 
mobility and progression. So let's just say you were in that level two um, <clears throat> arena, and you now you're looking for a larger opportunity. You're looking to be promoted, you're looking to be developed, and you're looking for um, or, or a new job in another organization or, or another industry. And so that's when I think the issues around mentoring and coaching and networking and really serious skill development come into play. And that's an important area because that's where many women and minorities get stuck, right? And so they stay right there because the next level is going to be that high executive level, of course. And so I think that if you, um, if, if organizations develop programs addressing those issues, I think that it helps uh, with the access across the board for all employees. So you're talking about co uh, mentoring and, and coaching, you're talking about um, basic skills training, you're, you're talking about uh, succession planning, uh, really making certain that uh, individuals, especially individuals who, uh, women and minorities, names get talked about in meetings that are important where people are talking about development and promotions and so forth. So I think those kinds of programs are, are critical and not just for window dressing. So when you have someone come in to do some kind of an audit, you can say, well, we, you know, this is what we've done. But because you really mean it and you want it to, and you want to improve and you want uh, women and minorities to be a part of the organizational mosaic, right? And so I think you know, if you put those kinds of uh, programs in place and you have someone who is championing those those kinds of activities and those kinds of uh, initiatives, that's a really good start for an organization. As well as, you know, training and diversity training comes into play, and I heard what um, <clears throat> uh, Marie said about whites, you know, the, the, the survey that you did about whites um, believing that there's you know, that they deserve to have certain programs, I guess, because there are laws that are, that are unfair to them. So um, that's interesting to me. I have to think about it some more because that also comes into play in organizations when you're trying to do diversity work because whites often feel that they're being slighted. So so, so I would give some credence to that, but I really need to know, know more about that, so I'm going to look into it. So, so bottom line is I think that if you have, again, put those programs in place, I think that if you are serious about them, you have checks and balances, you have accountabilities for managers and, and, and uh, supervisors, then you, you open doors, you start to open doors for people because that's really the main thing. You want to open those doors so that people can walk in and, and, and have opportunities that people from the majority group usually have. So that's how I see it. Is that excellent? Enough? Thank you that's so good. much. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Leah Adams is an assistant professor at George Mason University in the Department of Psychology and Women's Gender Studies, and she's a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm going to dig a little deeper here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so tell us, Dr. Adams, about your mentor and how important is it to have formal mentor programs in the workplace for women and even sexual minorities? Yeah, so... I am actually from Arlington. I elementary, middle, wow. high school. <laughs> Went to WNL right across the street over there. Um, and then, obviously, I still live in Arlington now. But I did spend some time away. I haven't been here my whole life. Um, and for me, mentorship has, has been important in a variety of ways. I've purposefully sought out different types of mentors. I've sought out women. I've sought out um, you know, black professionals, oftentimes in my line of work, it's hard to get both at once, so you gotta get a couple. Um, and I think that formal mentorship is, is really a key factor. I'm kind of piggybacking um, off of what Wanda said too, is that I, while I think that the formal mentorship is important, it's equally important to recognize what else is happening that you don't know about. Somebody gave me a great quote once, and I don't quite remember all of it, but, it, the gist is it's not just what you get, it's not just the perks that you get like formal mentorship, but it's also knowing what you don't know you don't have, right? So the informal access that sometimes you miss out on. Um, and so in that way, I think it's, 
really, really key to, to reach out, to have mentors who look like you, who have experiences similar to you. But I'd also say it's important to have mentors who are already a part of whatever it is that you're trying to get to, even if they don't share those same identities, because there's different information that they can often offer too. And so it's not an either or to me, I think it's, it's both, it's and. Excellent, thank you so much. La Pearl Smith, Business Development Manager for the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services for the State of Virginia. I'm gonna dig a little deeper with you as well. So, I'm glad I went early. <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> so, when's the last time you were shocked in terms of a case that blatantly was discriminatory and yet somehow was not on the radar screen? Hmm. Does anything shock you anymore? <laughs> At my age, no. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think the last time. Um, well, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to think of some of the, um, you know, the participants that we have, you know, placed in jobs where they lost those jobs due to their their disability, and. Um, Um, okay, yes, okay, um, there's a um, female participant um, that actually worked for the federal government that um, ca uh, came into work on a rainy day, slipped and fell, and injured her back. And um, she was no longer able to, because she was living outside of the immediate D.C. area, commuting in from Fredericksburg, um, her back just would not take that long commute, whether it's driving or the VRE or whatever the case might be. And, um, and she came across a lot of um, um, contention there from um, the powers that be and the agency she worked with, and I can't give all the details because of confidentiality, but um, they really almost kind of threatened her if she did not return to her regular job um, that she would be let go, and I, you know, um, I'm, you know, fortunately she was able to find another job, um, not, not quite at the level, because she was like a GS-13, so she was pretty much up there. She was able to find another job, but not quite comparable to what she had, but not having to commute quite as far. But I just remember the um, anxiety that she went through having to, to deal with that. I guess if I can ask this question, how many of you all are familiar with the Department for Aging Rehabilitative Services, or DARS? Anybody ever heard of who we are? A few people, okay. All right, so is it okay to take, okay, all right. Um, I'll do the, the um, 60 second tour here. Um, we are Virginia's public vocational rehabilitation and our primary mission is to create the um, culture for persons with disabilities to move into successful employment. A um, little history of VR. VR actually was an, an outgrowth of the Veterans Administration when many of the um, veterans were coming back from World War II with, um, you know, battle injuries and all that and wanting to, you know, go through some type of um, rehabilitation and training to get back into the workforce. And then out of that, back in the late 40s, um, came public VR. So there's a, a VR agency in every state in the union, and ours is the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. Um, for a number of years, we were Department for Rehabilitative Services. Um, and then about maybe three or four years ago, um, we came under the umbrella joining the Department for Aging and the Department of Rehabilitative, Rehabilitative Services. Say that fast, at almost eight o'clock at night. Um, and um, kind of joining under one umbrella with two divisions. So I'm with the Division of Rehabilitative Services. And again, you know, our job is to help persons with disabilities find gainful employment. Now, let me just say a couple of things about that. First of all, I hate the word disabilities, and I pretty much have taken it out of my vocabulary when I'm meeting with businesses, because my role as a business development manager is to create those partnerships with the business community, um, educating them, and just all of the myriad of opportunities and potential that's available with people with I call them people with diverse abilities. 
um, because if you're familiar with um, people that are getting Social Security disability, you know, Social Security is pretty much saying that you're not able to work to be substantial to be able to support yourself. So basically, they're saying you can't work. Well, if you take their definition and then, you know, put that definition out there in the, the work in today's workforce, you have a lot of businesses, you know, HR people and hiring managers that ask that question, well, can they work, you know? And so part of what we do as an agency is to educate the business community on what disabilities are and what they aren't. You know, I love all the regulations and rules, you know, the EEOC, love the EEOC people and any, all the other people up here. I've, I've learned a lot just sitting on this panel. Um, unfortunately, rules don't change people's attitudes. Okay, that's the sad part about it. But the rules do kind of help people do the right thing most of the time. And so, um, you know, so we, we, you know, we, we educate, you know, the business community on all of the p possibilities of hiring people with disabilities. Most persons with disabilities acquired that disability later in life. There's only a small percentage of people that were actually born with congenital disabilities. You know, the, the child, the person that's born with a birth defect or the person that, you know, has an um, intellectual disorder, person that maybe was born without a limb. Mo the majority of people with disabilities acquire those disabilities later in life. And you think about some of the notables, like the late Christopher Reeve, the man that played Superman, horse riding accident in Charlottesville, and the rest is history, okay? So, um, so you know, th those are things, and as the, as the population is living longer, um, you know, you're, they're, you know, probably, and to, in the, the nation today, you're probably, and, and to the workforce, I would say about probably 58% of the workforce in America are people that have some type of disability. Because a person with a hearing impairment that wears a thing in their ear, the hearing aid, is a person with a disability. Now, you know, back 30 years ago, they looked like, you know, they were wearing a bomb because, you know, that were all these cords hooked up to the ear. Now, a hearing aid is probably no bigger than my thumbnail, and they wear it in the ear, you would never know. All these folks are here that are wearing glasses. Wearing glasses could be considered a disability. Again, depending on what level of vision impairment you have. Okay, so probably everybody in this room has a disability of some type, but you know, we, you know, either A, live to, learn to live with it and, and, and make the most of it and not let the disability define who we are. And that's the important thing. It's the thing we try to teach to our participants. Do not let the disability define who you are. You are more than what your disability label says that you are. But the other side of our agency is to educate our participants and staff on what the employers are looking for in the workforce because we realize that in order for employers to, um, or businesses I should say, to embrace hiring our people, um, our participants, that we have to prepare them to meet the skills and the expectations of today's workforce. So we spend you know, quite a bit of time you know, educating our participants on you know, those, you know, not only the technical skills but also the soft skills that are needed to be able to compete. You know, those critical thinking skills or those customer service skills or whatever skills are out there that, you know, the business community is looking for. Uh, we're grateful for the partnership that we have with Catherine Carey over here, who's with the um, DC um, Metro Business Leadership Network and she does a great job advocating for our um, participants. Um, so that in a nutshell is what, um, you know, we do. I do want to mention, you know, that you've heard, you know, representation from minorities and women and immigrants. The disability population, and again, I hate using that word, but for lack of a better term right now, the disability population is represented in all of those demographics. Men, women, whites, people of color, immigrants. You know, our Fairfax office, um, which is the largest office in our agency, probably has a representation of about 50 different cultural groups that are, that are you know, candidates in um, our office. So, you know, it's a disability touches every segment of our society. Thank you. Thank you.